All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the people set to jump into the room here. Uh, <laughs> welcome to our uh, first 2022 webinar, uh, Reds, What Coaches Need to Know. Um, this is uh, the first of four webinars we're going to do this spring. And um, if you haven't uh, been on one of our webinars before, or you don't know me, my name is John LaFranco. I'm the manager of coaching education for Athletics Canada. And today we have with us Rachel Steele, uh, Mike Wojcikowski, and Melanie Myron to discuss the challenges, successes, and experiences um, in staying healthy and uh, as athletes and competing at high levels. We're going to talk about RAS, we're going to talk about eating disorders. Um, so a couple things before we begin. You're all uh, muted out there. And um, if you have questions, please address them in the questions uh, dialog box. There's a Q&A box. Vous êtes bienvenue à demander des questions en français aussi. Et je vais les traduire pour l'audience. So French, if people want to ask questions in French, they can. And I'll translate them for those uh, panelists who, who don't speak French. Um, and um, we'll, well, we'll have some questions for, for our panelists. We're going to go kind of have a, have a chat here, and then uh, we'll open up to your questions after that. Uh, we are recording the webinar, and um, we are keeping them and archiving them, and they will be available on our website um, soon, I think. Um, the AC website's going through a revamp a bit right now, so the coaching page is, uh, is being kind of it's under construction, but uh, once we're ready to go live, we're going to have a nice nice archive of video content for, for everyone. Um, and finally, coaches uh, who have entered their NCCP number uh, when the registration will get one B point uh, if you're uh, NCCP certified and points to maintain your certification, uh, you'll get a point for attending this webinar. And um, so speaking of webinars and our series, just wanna say uh, the next one, just plug it a little bit, um, it's on February 24th. It's called Pregnancy and Returning to Sport Postpartum. And uh, we've got some, some big names on that one. Melissa Bishop, Wendy Elmore, Jessica Zelenka, and Dr. Francine Derek. Uh, Kyle's going to put the link to register in the chat uh, right now if you want. And it'll be on AC social channels and in our newsletter uh, over the coming weeks if you want to sign up for that. Okay. So our panel. Uh, we have... Mike Wojcikowski, who is a 1997 Aquinas College graduate, is in his 24th season as the Saints head coach, uh, cross-country coach, and fourth year as the head uh, track field coach. It's commonly known as Woj, and he's enjoyed an incredible success at the helm of the Aquinas programs, including a lengthy list of conference championships, numerous individual and relay, uh, NAIA national championships, and has won conference and region coach of the year honors. So uh, great experienced coach here with us and Mike. Rachel Steele is the author of the book Running in Silence, which shares her story as an all-American athlete struggling with anorexia and binge eating. She serves on the board for the Michigan Eating Disorder Alliance and was a mentor for the U.S. Uh, Track and Field and Cross Country Coaches Association Female Coaches Mentorship Program. Uh, she's based in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where she's currently writing a second book and coaching high school cross country. Melanie Myron is a nurse practitioner in primary care, working at a family medicine clinic and elderly care residence in the West Island of Montreal. She was an All-Canadian and academic All-Canadian at McGill University in cross-country and track and field while doing her master's in nursing. Uh, she ran her first marathon in 2014 in three hours and four minutes, five seconds, and quickly improved, uh, running 239.10 at the Toronto Waterfront Marathon in 2017 placing as the third at the Canadian Championships. In 2018, she finished ninth at the Chicago Marathon and then ran her personal best at 233 in uh, 2019 in Rotterdam, where she also finished ninth. And that performance qualified her for the World Championships in 2019, uh, where she finished 27th in the heat and humidity of Doha. Uh, she currently runs with the Vancouver Plus Club in Montreal and is coached by Joe LaFranco, which is me. I'm here to moderate, but also because I coach Mel, um, so we're going to talk about, you know, the coach athlete relationship. And so I'm here to kind of, you know, uh, be accountable for the things that, that Mel says and, and, uh, and just sort of talk about that, that connection there. So, um, 
I know a lot of a lot of preambles and stuff. One more just sort of first thing before we really dive into it, which is that, you know, to all who are watching, if, if you or anyone you work with is suffering from an eating disorder, there there is help. And hopefully you know, this webinar will help towards that, but there's real professional help. Um, Kyle's going to put some resources in the chat uh, for you now. Um, and um, there's, there's just a few different things. Like on our Athletics Canada, we have uh, on our City Sport page, we've got some, some uh, information there. Um, Athletes Embodied is a Canadian organization that uh, helps in this area. It's also Running in Science, which is Rachel's website. And there's a ton of great resources there. Um, NEDIC, which is the uh, National Eating Disorder Institute of Canada, I think that's what it stands for. That's sort of the Canadian association. And then the nationaleatingdisorders.org is the American association. So you know, people in different countries looking for help, that's where you can, you can get that. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sensitive and, and serious topic. So we just wanna make sure that, you know, that people are directed to the right spot. So now we get to the people who know about this stuff. So just, I wanted to start with Rachel, just because you've done a lot of research and, and you know, aside from experiencing it yourself, um, research, in your research and writing, can you give us a bit of a background on what is an eating disorder? What kinds of behaviors define this and, and you know, other concepts like disordered eating and how are they connected? Yeah, so an eating disorder is basically a mental illness that really has a lot to do with the preoccupation with food, weight. Um, usually it can be anyone at any size. So a lot of people will first think of anorexia or bulimia and someone who's very skinny, but it can affect anyone at any size, any weight, any race, any gender. Uh, a lot of men struggle with this as well. And in terms of eating disorders with sports, they do look a little different. Sometimes a lot of athletes feel that if they get to a certain body shape or weight, they're going to perform better. So a lot of their eating disorder is circled around the sport itself. And they're trying to do it for performance gains, even though in the end, it's actually going to probably stop them from doing their sport at some point. And usually eating disorders have a lot to do with constantly thinking about food, Maybe someone will start dieting, whether it's like a raw food diet, like I was doing at one point, or even going into becoming a vegetarian and then vegan. And they're just very preoccupied with food. They're constantly thinking about it. They might be weighing themselves several times a day. They could be leaving meals to go throw up through vomiting in the bathroom, or they're exercising to try to lose weight excessively basically behaviors that are taking over their entire life. It's going to affect them socially, emotionally, and physically. So again, I just can't stress this enough. It's not just a physical change. And the difference between disordered eating and a full-blown eating disorder, basically it's all of those characteristics of an eating disorder, but for disordered eating, it's less severe, which doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention to it because often disordered eating can lead to a full-blown eating disorder. And a lot of the dieting methods we often see in our society today could be examples of some disordered eating behaviors. And it's definitely how it affects you uh, and everything else you're doing in your life. Hey, thank you for that, uh, that great summary. So um, Mel and Rachel, maybe we'll just jump to, to Mel, let, let you start. Um, what, what were your experiences with with eating disorders and I should say first too like thank you for being open about this because I think you know it's it's tough it's tough to talk about but it's important for people to hear hear these experiences so Mel do you want to start there you're muted so that yeah <laughs> yeah hello you're on mute sorry <laughs> uh I thought I was unmuted before. Um, so I started, um, I had an eating disorder when I was 14. So very early on in my running career, uh, I started running with a coach outside of school, um, outside of my high school at 13. So a year into it, I started to really start restricting what I was eating. I felt um, I did have body image issues. I always felt bigger than the other girls. Um, I am more muscular per se. So I guess I thought I was bigger, even though I just have maybe a different body type. Um, but I remember starting to improve just because I was running more and running more consistently. 
And uh, that winter, the indoor track, I kind of thought I was bigger than the girl that came first and second. So by restricting what I was eating, maybe I could improve. Uh, it was kind of that thought process. But also what came along with it is this idea of control. I was really trying, by controlling what I was eating, what I was putting in my body, it gave me this sense of control over kind of this performance anxiety I had over my whole life. I was trying to perform well in school, perform well at the track. And this was all self like pressure I was putting on myself. There was no one externally who was putting this pressure on me. It was all coming from within. So um, I didn't have any preoccupations with calories or my weight because I didn't really know what my weight was. I was 14, so I didn't get on a scale. I don't even remember if I had a scale at home, but I was preoccupied with how many grams of fat I was eating, what I was eating. I would never have a dessert. I started limiting uh, the amount I was eating. I just remember being always hungry, um, always looking, planning what I was going to eat for the next meal. Um, I was unhappy. I definitely wouldn't consider myself a happy runner by the end of all that because I wasn't, I was so preoccupied with the food intake. I couldn't fully enjoy my sport. I couldn't fully enjoy the social aspect of it. Um, so I ended up burning out, getting injured and then burning out. So unfortunately I did have to take a step away from the sport at one point due to the eating disorder. Right. Thanks. Thanks for, for sharing. You know, I kind of know that story. It's still, you know, sort of, it's tough to hear. It's just like, it's like a teenage girl and she's trying to have fun and it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's a yeah, hard thing. Kind to of do. taking it too far, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so Rachel, what was, what was your experience? Well, I've always been very much a perfectionist and I had a lot of anxiety from a young age. So I think those were like the precursors and usually big changes in your life will sort of start this, not midlife crisis, but this change in your life with mentally. And I think a lot of people experience this, whether they're going into high school or college or they're finishing up college. And I was actually entering college from high school and thought that I just needed to make a few changes about my body just because I wasn't comfortable. My mom had always talked about how we're just larger women, like just broad and strong. But to me, I didn't really like it. So it started as a body image issue. And I decided to just start limiting how much I was eating at each meal. And then that led to me researching a lot and thinking that I would want to become a dietitian and constantly thinking about food and thinking this is just something I need to fix in myself. That eventually led to counting calories, losing weight, and making that connection between losing weight and running faster because initially I felt like it was a huge jump for me. And I have always been an avid runner from a young age. Since I was five, I've been running. And I was so excited that I felt like I was finally reaching all of my goals. And I thought the secret to success was controlling food. So of course that spiraled into me really getting preoccupied with food and wanting to be better and better and lose more and more weight. Unfortunately, uh, I kind of came to a point where it was taking over everything that I did. And I got to my breaking point when I started a raw food diet and found myself binge eating, which is another type of eating disorder that not a lot of people talk about, but it's very common. Most people don't just have one eating disorder. So I was eating enormous quantities of food and feeling like that was negatively impacting my running. And mentally, I was just constantly feeling shame and guilt. And yeah, my performances were just completely up and down. My emotions were everywhere. And it basically uh, led to me no longer running at this point, um, not because I think running or athletics is a bad thing, but it was taking over my life to the point where I just couldn't move forward and I had to find other things that would make me happy as well. Right, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. So what were the signs that, or signs or things that, that pushed you to make a change? Because both of you are, are sort of, you know, come out healthy on the other side of that. So Mel, you talked about how you, you, know, you had to stop and, and take a break. So how did you uh, figure out or, uh, were you helped? How, how did you get back to the healthy well, training? Well, I definitely wasn't self-aware enough to realize I had an eating disorder. I didn't even know, I didn't really know what eating disorders were, I don't think. Um, I thought what I was doing was normal and that this is what runners should do. This is how we improve. I'm a runner. I'm supposed to look this way. I'm supposed to be eating like this. So I was very much in denial, but 
my mom had brought me to go get a bathing suit because I was, I was training to be a lifeguard and she, I dropped weight. I guess I had gone from, I don't know. I went to the doctor. I was 88 pounds and five, three. And now I'm like 120. Like sometimes I'll be on the, the start line 115, but all to say is quite thin. Yeah. I was only 14, but I had dropped quite a bit of weight and she obviously had realized as well. But when she saw me in the bathing suit, she almost cried and brought me to my pediatrician who at the time was also a specialist in um, anorexia and eating disorder. So um, they kind of given me an ultimatum. They said, look, if you don't, in, if you don't start eating more, gaining weight, if we don't see that you reach like a certain level of uh, like putting on some weight, you won't be able to run anymore. That was kind of like the ultimatum. And I loved running so much. So I said, okay, I'm going to gain weight. And I saw a dietitian and we didn't do any psychotherapy, but uh it ended up working. I did regain some weight, but then I, I still was very preoccupied with food. So I think maybe that portion should have been dealt with at the time. Um, maybe there was, there was a missing piece there, but in the end I ended up getting injury after injury after injury. So I ended up, uh, and then just not enjoying it because I was always injured. So I, I ended up having to leave the sport for a little bit, but, uh, yeah, it was basically my parents that really realized and they were the ones that uh, supported me in getting out of that eating disorder. Cool. And what about you, Rachel? Well, I think the problem with sports is that if you're performing well, like I was when I initially lost weight and I was just very disciplined and hardworking, a lot of people didn't completely catch that I had an eating disorder. I didn't look, I guess, what many people might think thin enough to be in a hospital, but maybe on the edge of something not quite healthy. So no one approached me. I had a few teammates who kind of alluded to something, but it never really went into a full conversation. So when I started dieting with a raw food diet and then ended up binge eating, it was the binge eating I wanted to stop. So after a few months of that and thinking, Oh, I just can't get control of this. It's going to ruin my life and my running. I decided to tell my mom because she was the only one I was close enough to maybe admit something, but I told her in an email because I was too scared to tell her in person. I thought she would see me completely differently. I felt this was the complete opposite of where I'd been before. I thought I was just a failure in so many people's eyes. So that initial opening up stage was very scary but when I did talk to her and I go into more detail in this in the book, Running in Silence, she finally, we got to a point where she suggested going to professional help. So eight months after that, because I didn't want to go initially, she brought me to a support group. And from there, I went to an eating disorder therapist. And eventually that eating disorder therapist encouraged me to see an eating disorder sports dietitian. And I kept refusing because I didn't think a dietitian would help me. I th thought I knew everything about food. I thought she wouldn't understand the running aspect of it and how I wanted to compete well and get back to a certain weight. And I'm really glad I ended up going to her because she was one of the biggest parts of my recovery process. She was also a triathlon and a runner. So I felt very connected with her. We had like a kinship and she was so helpful through the process along with my therapist, but having someone who really understood the sports side of things and having her create a meal plan for me and help me to realize that all of these rules and regulations I'd put on myself caused me to be where I was and not that my body was broken was what really helped me want to continue to pursue recovery. That's, that's great. So I think, you know, a common thread there was, um, you know, it was moms or you know, family supporting. And then also the, the step is to go to a professional. So Mike's been, you know, quietly <laughs> listening there, but I want to ask first, I want to ask Rachel and Mel, um, you know, about how the, how they sort of uh, interacted with the coach or how they sort of felt that the coach impacted this whole situation. Um, and I think just to point out and, to, you know, the, the professional help, like we're not suggesting that the coach is going to be the one to solve this or that the coach should I think that, that the message is really like, and as we'll hear, you know, after I'm sure, but like the professional help is, is the, is the way that you want to go. And the coaches is, is there, but we want to make sure that, that it's the point is made that it's, you know, the, 
doctors and the nutritionists and dietitians that are going to really deal with this. But how in, in that sort of moment of, of figuring things out, did, did the coaches impact your, uh, your lives or your situation? Mel, you want to start? For me, um, I'm, I know my, my parents had a conversation with my coach, but I don't think it really, from what my mom tells me, it didn't really resonate with him like I don't he he was 70 a 75 year old now he's like 95 or 96 so was it me at the time yeah um <laughs> retired yeah, yeah phys ed teacher and uh, he meant very well and honestly I don't think I'd be with the runner today if it wasn't for him because I just worked so hard with him and anyway I do have a lot of positive things to say about that man and I I do truly care about this person a lot but I don't think he completely understood um, what it what it was, what it meant, and um, he might have like contributed to the eating disorder as well. I remember, I specifically remember certain things. We'd go to the McGill Open, and uh, if we beat some of the McGill girls because we were all a lot younger, he would be like, "Oh, he would call them fat, like if they were bigger than us." Like he would he would say things like that, and um, you know, I remember that. So obviously, it did it did affect me. Um, if, uh, I remember being so thin and I am quite muscular, so you could see all the muscles in my legs and he would, uh, he would name the muscles in my legs to some of the people at practice, like kind of showing it off. Like, uh, like I was an, like an anatomy poster, you know, mm. which is, is not good. It's kind of, so definitely, I don't think he was a positive. I think we tried to have, you know, conversations with him. Um, but other people on the track team did have all the track team, um, speak to a doctor who also spoke, like talked about eating disorder. So eventually like other people that were part of the club, uh, brought up the subject. Um, but the coach himself, he wasn't, uh, I don't think he completely understood the concept to be honest. Yeah. So the, the coach words can, can really have an effect and even just sort of a throwaway comment. I mean, I think any coach now who call an athlete fat, that's not a throwaway comment, you know, at all, but I think, you know, he probably didn't think he was saying anything wrong, but it's so just words are so important. So yeah, I remember Rachel, that 22 yeah. years later. So, or 20, yeah. whatever long time. <laughs> Rachel, what, what about you and your coach? Yeah, well, a few coaches in high school, I have been so lucky to have really good coaches for most of my running experiences. There was one coach in high school who had noticed I had dropped some weight and mentioned it, but I took it as a compliment. Um, he asked me if I was eating enough because I looked really thin. And yeah, so I took that as a compliment, which a lot of people may not understand about eating disorders. But usually if you make a comment about someone's weight, they're actually going to take it the wrong way and want to try to either lose more weight or just take it as a compliment. So that wasn't perfect, but he noticed something was wrong. And then when I went to college, um, Woj didn't really, what didn't have a lot to compare. I mean, I came in uh, for the first time at this lower weight, so I didn't lose weight in his presence. Um, and I, once I told my mom about what was going on and then I went to therapy, my therapist encouraged me to talk to my coach about it. And the thing I really appreciated about Woj's philosophy and everything he did with coaching is we had an online running log. I don't know how many other colleges have that, but I absolutely loved it. But it also gave me some space to type out and talk about what was going on with me mentally and physically, because we had to write those kind of comments. I kind of went overboard because I'm a writer. But I had alluded to some things in the past. And then with my therapist recommendation, I emailed Woj to talk about what was going on. And I'm very thankful because that first conversation, again, I talk about this in the book too, but like he just started talking about like these everyday things and like what the season's gonna be like just to get me comfortable. And then we actually got into the conversation and he completely focused on mental health and how he wanted me to be physically and mentally well, and that, you know, I expressed my fears about not competing as well, because I thought I had to be a certain weight to run well. And he told me not to even worry about that. Like he just wanted me to be healthy. And even though I didn't completely believe it at the time, I was like, okay, he's just trying to be like a softy coach. <laughs> I need hardcore. Um, it was actually so helpful because if I was only focusing on the weight and I had a coach telling me to lose more weight, I would have just gotten further into the eating disorder and probably not have competed at all for the next few years. 
And luckily with his full support, he wasn't giving me advice. He didn't tell me what I should be eating. He was just there to support. I was able to compete for the next few years. I was not perfect. My performances were up and down and crazy, but he continued to have conversations with me. And even though he didn't know everything there is to know about eating disorders, he was just very supportive. That's great. That's great. So let, let's hear from, from Mike. You know, how, how did you experience all this? How did you see it? Um, and, and how did you feel about it? Cause it sounds like you did all the right things, but what, you know, how, how was that for you? Is that difficult? Is it, you know, how, how did you figure out what to do? Yeah, it was probably a, a newer experience for myself. I mean, probably it's my 24th year coaching and, and probably that had been, was it like 10, 12 years ago, Rachel, something like, something like that. So maybe yeah. halfway through, um, and just hadn't had to deal with any of that type of situation and maybe it was going on, maybe it wasn't, but I think Rachel was the first one that kind of brought it to light. And, and, um, I mean, she was a really high profile athlete in the, in the West Michigan area. I mean, she had a lot of different opportunities to go to, to bigger schools. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the competition and we we're probably the smallest school by far. Um, but I was, you know, when we were going through these conversations as she was going through a lot of this, we were, I was just so thankful. There was a reason why she came to Aquinas um, and, and, and to be paired together as coach and athlete because they, the situation like Rachel just alluded to, it could have manifested as something into so, so much worse. And, you know, I'm, I'm competitive. I want it, I do well, but not at the, not the sake of the student athletes, um, mental or physical health. So, um, well, like Rachel said, I didn't, I didn't know background or I didn't know how hey, to, to help. And, and part of it is a younger coach and you're going through this and you, you think the best of all, a lot of your athletes or most of your athletes. And, you know, Rachel's a very intelligent person. She does her research, you know, I mean, as, as, as someone that, you know, mutually respects that coach athlete yeah. relationship, like she's doing, she wouldn't be doing anything negatively to herself to get better. Um, and that just wouldn't, you know, it wasn't crossing my mind because of the type of person that she was. But as you learn and you go through and you learn more information about what people are going through when you're developing different habits and things, it's it's easy to hide. It's easy to fake um, through some things and let people know. And and um, so this it was kind of a learning process for me, but like my biggest way I could help was just being a person that could listen uh, with what she had to talk about. You know, we sat there over at my desk and we would smile, laugh, lots of cry. I would, she starts crying, I'd start crying and we just, you know, it's fine. It's, it's, and then that's real, that's human emotion. And I think that wasn't, you know, I think that was something important to me that I, I didn't want to see her suffer anymore. And, and I wanted to see her, um, you know, I don't even, you know, a lot of her races, I don't even remember anymore. I'm, but I remember what she's doing now. Um, I was just so in offer at the convention that we had back in December in Orlando and you go to a lot of those symposiums and it's just the same thing the thing you're learning about training theory and it's the same thing you coach to coach to coach it's the same type of thing but the to watch the people in her room how engaged they were and taking notes and just on a subject they everyone knows about tempo running and, and interval training and, and weightlifting but you know that's I, that was just I, I popped in there because I was in between meetings and just for 10 minutes and to see her just I mean, have the whole whole room, the whole audience, just totally listening and soaking it, soaking up every word she was saying. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm watching the pictures and the slides and, you know, I live through that. I read, you know, when I read the book, it's like, it's weird when you're reading it because you're a character in the, in this book of, of her passage through this, this experience. And, you know, I, when I look back at it, I mean, I, it was hard. It was times where you just, you kind of shake your head or you wonder, but you know, like I said, the only way to, for me to be helpful and beneficial at that time and going through all that just taught me so much more on how to, to do things with the future teams going on. And, you know, by making it a forefront of a, a topic that's not taboo, it's not something that we should be ashamed to talk about it. You know, we, you know, I've had a couple of assistant coaches who were females the last X amount of years who were, who were college athletes as well and, and did deal with that as, as a college athlete in a bigger situation and able to come into our cross country camp and talk about, you know, these freshman girls who were there for the first time meeting everybody and talking about these hard topics of, and you know, events that go to on the men and women um, endurance athletes and things was so, was so good. And just learning, 
learning more um, and my perspective, just kind of what to look for, what to, to look out as, as people are doing things and not just assuming that they're doing everything right or they have all the answers, which is actually just kind of learning um, from past. And like I said, I'm, and applying it to what I'm doing now with everything from, you know, meals on the on the on trips and post meat meals at home and it was, it's always so easy just to do the the easiest thing and then people may not be eating i'll just get you order pizza for the team and we barely do that anymore because a it's probably not the best and I, it's not the best thing after uh running a, a hard meat but you know ordering a variety of, of beans and, and and rice and tacos from area taco places get noodles and company to cater our meals and things like that um being more conscious of what we're serving at camp, having some of my assistants take the team through the cafeteria um, and explain, this is, you know, you just had a hard workout. This was what we should be eating. You know, we need the calories, we need the fuel, we need to, you know, it's, it's easy to say that. And I've probably caught myself in that many times. Say hey, you gotta, all right, you know, you gotta do next to make this workout really benefit you, but are you actually walking them into the cafeteria and when their options are endless on what to put in their body? So, um, I just, I've been really lucky to, to be able to have that, you know, to go through that with Rachel and as bad as it, you know, sometimes as it was, or just like hard it was, it really kind of opened my eyes to a lot of new things. And overall with the whole, you know, a lot of it, I probably I know more now than I did, but I'm still nowhere near an expert. And I think the, you know, as a coach, you want to have these kids as they're getting older, that's always been the best thing to me is when they're coming back 10, 15, 20 years later um, in whatever their profession is, or you know, they're, they're, they're married to so-and-so and, -so and they have these kids and, and, and that's the success. You know, I, I don't remember what Rachel's PR was, but I know what she's doing now and you know what's going on with her life. And like I said, it was great to, to share some time with her and her husband uh, at the convention in Orlando, just had a great, great dinner that night and just you know talking not it's not as you know even when we were coaching athletes I, just, I mean I've been coaches for a lot of for many years but I think if you look at a more of a, at an equal and, and not this power type of position that a lot of coaches do and like I said I've always and we and talked about it many times and just so thankful that Aquinas was where she ended up and you know I don't know what that final, you know, I think we probably talked about what that final reason was, why um, that actually pushed you to that school. But um, the other options, I just, it would have been, who knows what the situation would have been. And yeah. it, it wouldn't have been a, an experience that, you know, a, a good experience to come out of. So, yeah, that's, that's great. So much good stuff in there. I think like just to kind of maybe like recap for folks, like it's, it's a, it's a learning experience. And as, as a coach, we grow, you know, you're not, you know, sort of come out as a coach and then we're just sort of fully formed and we stay that way. It's, we, we do learn from things and, and people do, you know, make mistakes and stuff. But it, I mean, it sounds like with that situation, you managed to do the right stuff. And, and even from there, you, you know, we're able to, to improve. And I'm um, just, you know, that I think it's coming up more and more now, this idea of the coach athlete power imbalance. And I think this is a situation where that can really be potentially damaging because the athlete sees that and like, you know, wants to impress the coach or wants to please the coach and thinks that performance is the way to do that. And though therefore losing weight is the way to do that because that's how you get performance, et cetera. And so the, the coach has a crucial role that could be either, you know, uh, what I'm looking for. It's, it's either can be, you know, very positive or very negative, but it's, it's sort of like a, a catalyst role. So that's, that's great to hear. And I, I, you know, I hope the coaches listening are, are able to kind of see, you know, see a bit of themselves in, in Mike and, and I think get that confidence to like, just, you know, to, to just listen. I think it takes confidence sometimes as a coach to not coach, <laughs> to not tell you what to do and just to actually just listen and, and, and see where you're at and stuff. So that's, that's fantastic. And, and I think also, you know, you mentioned the, the assistant coaches, like, and you're mentoring them now and, and, helping them and start their careers and, you know, having this be sort of a normalized thing, like you said, it's just a topic that, that is important to talk about, you know, throughout the season with the team. So that's awesome. Um, so I want to switch gears again here and, um, you know, Mel, you, you had a bit of a break there and then you came back to the sport, obviously 
uh, highly successful competing for Canada at the World Championships. So how, what allowed you to kind of come back and achieve at a high level um, after going through this eating disorder? Yeah, well, I think um, taking a break from the sport might have been good. It allowed me to identify myself as someone other than a runner. Um, when you're 14, you still haven't really developed your whole sense of self. So I think um, I was like, I find the more I identified as a runner, the, the worse my eating disorder got. And then eventually just when I stopped running, it didn't completely go away, but over time it did, I would say. Um, and then just, you know, making friends and going to Sejep, doing all that stuff. And then when I decided to get back into running, um, when I went back to, um, to university to do my, my uh, bachelor's in nursing, I went on to the varsity team, but I came back thinking, I just wanted, I'm competitive. I always like to work hard. I push myself hard. I always have pretty, um, challenging goals for myself, but I really wanted to have fun. You know, I wanted to have fun with the other teammates. I wanted to, to enjoy myself. And that was really important to me just to come back and have fun. And I wasn't having fun. Um, I wasn't, it was not fun to always be preoccupied with what you're eating and to, um, it sounds pretty simplistic, but I really want to come back and just enjoy myself and wanted it to be part of my life, not my whole life and not preoccupy my whole mind. So, and then I gradually restarted and, um, and I found a way to have fun and enjoy the sport. And then I continue to improve, which is, which is really fun and, uh, stay consistent. So, yeah, I mean, improving is fun. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, so it all, you know. and then, you know, you just learn with experience and with time and with a good support system and, um, that you don't, you know, your body will change the way it has to change to perform. And you're, and when you're eating intuitively and eating based on your hunger, which takes time to learn after having an eating disorder, um, you, you'll perform wonderfully and your body will fluctuate based on what you're doing. And it'll always be where it needs to be when the race comes, uh, when the big race comes. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, I think, you know, like, I think like to say, like, a, you know, a happy runner is a, is a fast runner. Um, and, and it's a really great message there for, you know, I mean, people who are heading into university and that, and, and who are competitive and want to do well and the, you know, having fun and being able to stay in the sport and be consistent over a longer period of time is the thing that's going to get you, you know, to the, whatever world championships or whatever, whatever it is, if you don't have that, you won't get there. Cause if you're not, you know, happy and healthy, then it's, you know, you're going to keep encountering roadblocks. Um, so I wanted to ask just about, um, you know, we touched on this a bit before with, um, with your, your, uh, high school coach, Mel, um, and just to maybe turn around on, on like more positive stuff, like what Mike was doing, what are, what are coach behaviors or coach, even like language things you'd like to see to, you know, coaches do, even though we talked about how the coach has a pretty defined specific role, what, what are some specific things that coaches can do, uh, to, to help prevent eating disorders? Yeah, definitely like not focusing on bodies, weights, not making comments on weight or people's phys physical, like how they look physically. I think that, that especially for some maybe young, maybe, not even just younger, because I think it could happen any, any time of your running career, but for, for people that are sensitive or, you know, end up uh, being, it could be a trigger for them. Um, if they see, they want to always impress their coach. So in the end, even if you have an equal, um, you know, equal, like even if you're equals, like in, I don't know, in your relationship, you still want to impress your coach no matter what, you know? So I think it's important to just not talk about people's bodies and what they look like. That's number one. Number two, provide resources like a dietitian, like we spoke about other professionals. Um, when someone joins a club or you're coached by, by someone, if you can provide, um, you know, that that's super important providing other resources that people communicate with. Uh, also, um, I think just having talks about eating disorders, you know, if ever there's a team or, uh, just being open to the concept, knowing it's not taboo, um, uh, and knowing it's not a weakness per se, it's just, you know, it's something that some people end up having. It's a mental illness and you can get through it, but you need support by your coach. So, knowing that you would be supported if, if that ever were to occur. 
So I think just having an open communication, and I think it was interesting what Rachel said, like writing for her was an avenue of communication that worked for her. So maybe having multiple ways of communicating with your coach, not just face to face, because right after practice, it might not be something you want to talk about, but maybe through email or through a messenger or whatever it is, um, that could be interesting as well. Cool. Rachel, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm a high school coach and having had an eating disorder, I knew that this was a pretty common issue, especially the more I heard from other people saying that they struggled with this as an athlete. So like Mel said, having that open conversation with your athletes really opens up the door. I've seen the more and more we talk about it over the years, the more athletes feel like they can come talk to us about that, even Mm -hmm. if it's uncomfortable for them at first, just saying like, Hey, we know this is a thing we're here to support you and really utilizing your resources. Uh, the athletic trainer is a good person to go to in terms of just like asking what you need to do next. If you do suspect an athlete might be struggling. I started developing a really great relationship with our athletic trainer at the high school and had this conversation ahead of time asking like, what are the protocols? If someone does have an eating disorder, what's the step I should take? And just keeping up that email communication, showing your athletes how important it is or how valuable it is to be able to connect with other resources and professionals. And please, please, please find a way, if you don't have a dietitian, find a way to bring one in. Even if it's just to speak one time to the team, that's better than nothing at all. That's something we've been lucky enough to do. We've raised funds to bring in a dietitian to speak each year to the girls and they have have been so thankful for that. It just gives a lot of information in a short amount of time and shows that we value their health and yeah, make those resources available. Talk about it. You don't have to know everything there is to know about eating disorders. We don't have to be professional like therapists or dietitians, and it's okay that we're not that, but just show that you're open to having these conversations. What's a, what's a good way to start the conversation? Um, you know, I think for, for coaches, you know, they may feel like, uh, like, like you said, like they don't know, or they may feel like, well, if I talk about this, it's just going to make people like think it's a good idea or something. How, how do you, you know, reach the topic and, and sort of help coaches not, you know, have, uh, assuage those fears? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because usually we have our dietitian speak within the first two weeks of cross country. And I always ask that she addresses disordered eating, eating disorders, because she'll have like all the clinical information. She addresses red S. So the girls have already been sort of primed and prompted to think about that. And then usually when we have our closer discussions at our cross country camp, I bring up what the, what the dietitian talked about. I ask, I try to make it a conversation and ask the girls if they have additional questions or if they have some thoughts about those topics. I have found at first, I wasn't really open to talking about my own story because I wanted to focus on the team, but I noticed that the more I shared a bit about what I had gone through, the more they felt like they could speak up and see that like, it's not weird to talk about something you're struggling with. Mm -hmm. Um, So I sort of lead it in with that and ask them questions. We talk a bit about body image and, you know, they're inundated with everything on social media. We encourage them to follow registered dietitians instead of a very skinny looking runner, Um, you know, just making those little changes. So the conversation can kind of go wherever the girls are comfortable with it, Um, But again, just saying, acknowledging that, you know, eating disorders exist. If they feel like they're struggling with food, come talk to me as a coach. Um, And usually at the end of the conversation, we'll send out little slips of paper and the athletes can ask anonymous questions. Again, using the writing part, if they feel like they don't want to raise their hand in the middle of the discussion to start talking about this really deep thing. I have had questions on those comment cards that they want to talk later uh, about whatever they're struggling with. So yes, a lot of coaches fear talking about it because they think they're just going to spread it. Um, But it's 
already happening. And if you don't talk about it and you notice there's different behaviors going on, people are commenting about food or weight and you don't say anything mm -hmm. and you don't do anything, you're essentially condoning the behavior. Uh, this has to be discussed at some point. Again, doesn't have to be discussed in great detail. We don't have to be an eating disorder professional, but just say you know it exists and you're here to support them and get them to the right resources. You mentioned the, the girls team. Um, is, is there a boys team? Do you have the same conversation with boys? Do you, do you see the sort of similar things or does it manifest maybe differently? Yeah, it probably manifests a little differently in men, but I'm also glad you mentioned that because eating disorders do affect men. I am not the men's cross country coach. I do see the guys for the track team because I'm the distance coach. I'm not the head track coach. I just started a few years ago. I would like to implement something like that. Hopefully this year, bringing the dietitian to that team, trying to encourage coaches across the board, not just in running to bring in the dietitian as well, to have that professional voice in there. Um, but yes, this can absolutely be a conversation with boys and men as well. Do you, do you have that conversation with the guys team, Mike, at, at Aquinas? Yeah, I mean, that's the nice part of, um, you know, the, the program we have right now. It's, it's, it's kind of all encompassing. We, we do everything kind of together. Um, you know, when we, when we meet for practice, it's the same time, it's the same workouts, it's the same message. Uh, we, we get together before the start of practice. It's, I don't talk to the guys and the girls. It's, it's more um, one program. And, and I think that's been, it's a nice to kind of, I think it, it never used to be like that the first, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 years I was there. I had, it was a men's coach and a women's coach uh, for cross country. Um, and then eventually, yeah, after so many years, I just took over for both. And it's been nice because then that same message can be put out through um, to, to, to both groups. And um, we kind of learned a lot this, you know, over that whole COVID year and, and things with not being able to do like fall of 20, we could only get together three times a week. And I was, we were in pods of, of, of 10 people at a time. And, you know, so it was like, and we still ended up running, uh, we didn't have a season, but we ended up doing some time trialing at the end and we ended up running just as fast as if we did it was a normal season. So kind of looking at going into a nor normal cross year, do we need to meet six days a week uh, as a group? And we actually cut it down a, a bit to four or five days a week. And I used Monday as a day of, I blocked out 12 to three. So I think sometimes it's given the kids an opportunity to come in and talk. We call it mental health Monday. You come in and uh, you got to do the six to 10 miles whenever you get it in, but that's, that's the easy part. Um, and I, had, I think this fall, I had probably some of the freshmen were almost in. It was like clockwork, 1.30 on Monday. Um, I didn't even have to put, put it in my schedule because I knew that person was going to come and, and want to talk. And, and maybe nothing was wrong. Everything was great. But this, that giving that, because sometimes you get so busy and you're just like going from place to place and you don't give the kids the, the opportunity to sit down and actually have a conversation with you. They don't want to try to catch you as you're leaving practice or at practice. It just doesn't doesn't work sometimes. So yeah. um, I think just giving the kids a, a little bit of a, a window during a week just to kind of come in. And like I said, even to talk if there's absolutely nothing wrong or everything's going wrong. And, you know, it was just kind of good to do that. And even I switched it to track now where we didn't Mondays is going to be more workouts. So we're going to meet. But today was a day Thursday pre meet day. But um, they, they know what they got to do, but the more important thing is maybe you talk race strategy, maybe you talk about what's going on and just having that more of an interaction and a connection um, with each of the kids, whether they're the fastest on the team or the, you know, the person that's, you know, the last one on the team. Like I said, they all, they all want to get better. They all want to do some good things. And I think it's just about sometimes the culture that you're cultivating within a program that I think is, is so good. We bring in re female recruits now and they've come from three other visits and they just, they just despite they, they didn't like the other business because all the other women talked about was splits and how mileage and interval you know it was and they came in and you know our girls they like to run I like them I like they, they're competitors but they're not you know we don't do 60 70 miles a week a lot of them run 40 45 miles a week but they do a lot of strength training they do a lot of you know all the um, mobility stuff um, taking care of their bodies better and then they can they're functioning better with maybe some less mileage but I think that's actually helped us in some recruiting because some people have other lives. They have, you know, we, we always talk about not letting your, a, your, a time dictate of who you are. Hey, you set a PR, 
great, but you're the same person. You know, yeah. you yeah. didn't run well. No, so what? It's, you know, everyone doesn't run well. It doesn't mean you're uh, a worse off person. So I think sometimes it's just developing the, the, the group. And like I said, if you know, that from when Rachel came through, I mean, if we started looking back from that moment, and you know, some of the girls that she ran with were not very, you know, heavily recruited, or they weren't all staters. They were, they were just okay. And then, and this turned into fabulous runners. And you know, I think it's been since that era in 2012 that we haven't finished out of the top 10 at nationals. So I think this is kind of that some of the stuff that we talked about tonight isn't um, isn't afraid to talk about, or it's, it's not a, a, a bad subject, or. I mean, just given making what the sport we're doing where it could lead to disasters and in tough situations just to try to promote all the goodness that can come from our sport and I mean, that that would, a lot of us learn from what we're doing yeah it sounds like a, a great team team culture and uh and and very proactive like i think if, you know if you're having a conversation with with people on a regular basis then it's it's more challenging for these sorts of things to you know to kind of slip through the cracks like it's it's going to come up or you're going to have a sense that something's wrong maybe and, and you know be in a position to say like you know hey what's up right um and and having built that relationship so that you can say that because you know maybe you know sometimes that you're not quite there yet so it's a great example of how it's it's holistic it's not just like okay let's have the eating sort of conversation check that box and move on like it's it's about kind of everything so um you know, I think, so this is for Rachel specifically, but I mean, if others want to chime in too, but you know, it's a hard thing to talk about. There's, there's like stigma, there's guilt around this sort, sort of thing. Um, how are you able to turn that around and not only, you know, sort of become healthy again, but actually like speak out, write a book, be a, an active promoter of, of information for, for athletes and coaches. What, what allowed you to kind of turn it around like that? Yeah, I want to emphasize that I was very scared because I think a lot of people think because I'm doing everything that I'm doing now that I just came out and talked about it, but it was a very long, gradual process. Like I said, when I first emailed my mom about what was going on, I was terrified. And to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with her right after that email was scary for me. I was being very vulnerable. And then eventually having the conversation with my coach and talking to my teammates about it. It was all very gradual step-by-step -step process over the years. And that led to me starting the Running in Silence website because I had been binge eating for a while and I had not heard a lot of other stories of athletes struggling with that or just athletes with eating disorders in general. I've always been told that with writing, if you really want to read something, but it's not available, then you write it. And so I decided I needed to be at least one person talking about this. So I started the website again, very scared because I thought anyone who would see me or see the pictures of me wouldn't believe that I really struggled with an eating disorder because I had the misconception that you have to be a certain small weight for your eating disorder to be valid, which is completely false. But so I started the website to explain everything that had happened to me and realized from all the messages I was receiving from other athletes that this was actually very common. And when I started coaching a few years later, I was curious as to why this wasn't really being talked about in coaching circles as well. There was no training for it. So things just kept snowballing where I realized the athletic community isn't talking about this. Coaches have no training we need to do something. And luckily I've had tremendous support from the community. I've had someone who helped me start the nonprofit. I had a wonderful friend who became the editor for the book. I had the support of my parents. They've always been extremely supportive. Um, and yeah, I, that led to the book and then the speaking engagements for the Running in Silence nonprofit, just to have these conversations because I didn't see them happening as much as I would have liked. And I don't want anyone else to go through what I went through. That's great. And I, you know, I think the key thing there is like, it, it is scary and, and it supplies a lot of things. Like if you see someone who's successful and who's out there and they make it look easy, um, but there, there's a long road to get there and, and to, to do that. Um, so I had one more question for Mel, and then we have a couple 
um, with maybe just one audience question. So Mel, um, you, know, you kind of alluded to this, but you know, this is something that happened to you um, a while ago, a few, you know, when you were 14. Um, is it something that still challenges you? Um, what do you do to sort of change your mindset if you start feeling like, you know, you, you need to be a certain way or you need to worry about what you can do? Yeah, like I don't, I don't feel challenged by it like on a daily basis. Maybe I'll get triggered sometimes. I remember being at training camps and there'd be other uh, female runners who, who could be very good runners and I would see them maybe restricting at certain times or, and it might, it would irritate me a bit. And I'm thinking to myself, why am I irritated by this? Not, I would never act irritated towards a person, but something inside me, like there was something inside me that was getting worked up by this. And it was probably the eating disorder thinking to myself, you know, I could restrict as well. I might see a benefit, like a benefit for a short period. You know, uh, if you lose a bit of weight, you might, you know, run a fast marathon, you know, your next marathon, but then will you be able to run several, you know, after that so or every like two a year I don't know it's just it kind of triggered something in me and then I I talk to myself I'm able to talk to myself and rationalize my my feelings and I I'm able to do that or and um and that's what I do I just talk to myself and tell myself look you're not going to go down that route um it's not sustainable you're happy now keep doing what you're doing you're improving there's no fast track way to improvement so keep doing that so I'm able to talk through talk it it sounds easy, but you just talk <laughs> yourself through it. And I still to this day don't have a scale. Why I don't go and buy one. I could, I'm postpartum now. I'm kind of curious to know how much I weigh. I'm definitely not where I was before I got <laughs> pregnant, but it just, I don't. And maybe that's because it would trigger something, you know, it's, sub, I've just subconsciously decided I'm not going to buy one and I'll just, well, is, it, is it necessary? It's probably not. It's probably not. This point, exactly. Right? So I'm I mean, you got to wait, wait, yeah, the, the boy, the little boy's got to get weighed every time. But that's, yeah, that's so yeah, that's one reason kind of why I kind of want to buy one, <laughs> just so I can weigh myself and then weigh him more often. <laughs> cool. So we had one question um, from, from the audience for Mike on the, those Mental Health Monday sessions. Did you have um, like another coach or support person or is like kind of an open door meeting? And, and do you, does it happen that you would, depending on how the meeting goes, um, maybe suggest like a, another avenue like send them to a different support person or something like that if they brought something up yeah I mean it's more of an open door um just let me know when they're going to come in on those days and kind of setting the schedule up and you know just kind of getting a feel for like you said sometimes it's just more or less to have that continuity of checking in but there's sometimes and you can tell there's um things going on whether it's you know it's it's it could be an eating disorder it could be relationships with uh roommates family boyfriend girlfriend situations and you know it's on a smaller campus it's it's really easy to connect with um, support services and counseling and, and, and things and just getting um, them involved and in, in getting them in that system I think is really important because once they get into it then they see how, how beneficial um, if it is and even for myself to go and, and see someone and just to talk it over and I think sometimes we think we all have everything figured out or we're all fine, but actually having that someone just to go and, and that has, you know, doesn't know you, isn't judgmental and just wanted to do that. So as, as I kind of go through stuff like that, it's really easy for me to kind of see the benefits of it and getting some of these kids who, you know, I just, you, you really, you, you see what they're going through and you don't want to minimize it because really it's to them, it, it may not, you know, 20 years later, you look at that and it's, that's, you guys are, you shouldn't be at this worked up over, but, but to that, at that point in their lives, it's, it's the biggest deal going on. And, and like I said, and I think that's, you know, is, is, has helped, I think a lot of the kids and all of a sudden they come back and it's, they're thankful just for that. It could have been one thing I said, or one conversation that kind of pointed them into a different direction to, like I said, I couldn't, I'm not going to be the one to help them, but I can be the one that listens and steers them in the right direction on, on how to get someone to help. Yeah. Yeah. exactly and that so that's i think the uh like the take-home message there like you know just start the conversation you don't have to be an expert and and you know bring it up make it something that's out in the open it's, it's not something that needs it's not you know needs to be a secret or, or hidden it's it's something that happens to people and and you know in order to help them get, get better you need to talk about it so um and i just want to mention two other things before we go rachel mentioned education and i don't i don't have like a a link or anything yet, but I just wanted to tease. Uh, Athletics Canada is working on, a, on an e-learning uh, for coaches on Reds, working with um, a, a researcher 
uh, Braden Charlton out in, in BC, and uh, we've got a couple other people kind of on our in our group working on this. Um, it just you know a way for coaches to kind of go through a bunch of topics related to reds and eating disorders and, and kind of understand it and and maybe come out of it feeling a little bit more confident to be able to talk about it. Again, not not an expert. You know, coaches don't need to be you know uh, dietitians or, or nutritionists or or anything, but just knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know and knowing where to go. I think that, that's going to be our goal for that. So, um, yeah, so look for that in uh, the coming months uh, on uh, these social channels and the newsletter. And uh, don't forget our, our next uh, webinar, Pregnancy, Returning to Sport Postpartum with Melissa Bishop, Melinda Elmore, Jessica Zlentan, Prince and Derek. And um, thank you, uh, Waj, Rachel, and, and Mel. Uh, this, was, this was fantastic. I think, um, you know, I think we, we all learned a lot. I learned a lot. I, it's, it's always great to host these things because you get to learn stuff. Um, and thanks to the, the audience uh, for, for coming listening. And as I said, we'll, we'll have this up on the Athletics Canada website uh, in short order so people can watch it again and, and learn from, from this. So thanks. Good night. Thank you. This is great. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.